Welcome back everyone to The Xamarin Show. I'm your host, James Montemagno, and today I am super excited. It only took me a year and a half to get this man right here on the show. Emo, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for inviting me like five times, I think. Like, five or six times, yep, yeah. I finally said yes. Um, yeah, my name is Emo Landworth. I'm a program manager on the .NET Platform team. My team, you know, does the things that are all, you know, the component parts of the runtime, you know, the GC, the JIT. The base class libraries, all the low level stuff that we all either really hate or really love. Usually, this it's one of the two, right? <laughs> it's kind of the stuff that makes it happen because it's like I fell in love with C sharp, right? But C sharp, the 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 core, that huge, amazing library of goodness, mm -hmm. right? Dot net. When I say dot and all this stuff I can magically do, that's the stuff that your team works on. Sort of. Sort of. Yes. Yeah, we don't own all the cool parts. Oh, okay. Like, like I mean, like ASP.NET is all the cool parts. Right? Visual Studio, C Shell, this is like the cool pieces. Mm -hmm. We own the plumbing that makes the cool pieces work. Got it. So, but without without that core plumbing, everything falls down basically. Yep. Got it. That's so, why my life is always fun. <laughs> and it's constantly moving. It's actually a really fun time to be a C Sharp and .NET developer, or F Sharp, or anything in the right. .NET ecosystem because not only is the languages constantly moving, you know, Mads was talking about C Sharp 7, 1, 7, 2, 8, 0, yep. and then new stuff of F Sharp coming out, and, and at the same time, .NET itself, even just the core .NET framework is, is evolving too. So it seems right. like it's a really fun time to be, a, it's always a fun time to be a developer. It's right? always the best time, yeah. every time you ship. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to have you come on the show, uh, the Xamarin Show, to talk about what it means in the scope of .NET, .NET standard libraries, how we're building and sharing code between our applications. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think of it as two parts. As the app developer part, like I'm developing an app, how do I share code? You know, I, I, one of the very first episodes I did on the Xamarin Show was sharing code. This is a right. year and a half ago. It's the most popular episode. And I talked about PCLs, I talked about just iOS and Android file linking, and I talked yep. about shared projects, my favorite. Yep. But that's one aspect to it because at the other end, there's all those things that you're consuming, such as NuGet libraries that are being created by library creators and developers of apps also are sometimes library creators. So I thought maybe we could break it down in two aspects. Yes. Yeah. So I think in general, like uh, people always seem to be confused about what .NET Standard is. And I mean, it's yes. basically a tool for library authors, right? From an app developer standpoint, there's no such thing as the standard, right? Because you're always targeting one particular slice of the .NET universe. So either building a .NET framework application or okay. a Xamarin application or .NET Core application. Because it's really about the you know the end-to-end. -end. Like you have a specific runtime you're running on, you have a specific OS you're running on. And the standard is basically the, you know, if you think of these things as verticals, you can think of .NET standard as the horizontal that is the cross-cutting pieces. Yeah. Like all the APIs you expect to be everywhere, like file.io, reflection, collections. Like all the things you don't really think about that you always assume to just be there. That's what the standard really is. That makes sense. So I've always shown that diagram with like an iOS app, an Android app, a yep. Windows app. And then yep. you, I guess you could tack on uh, a, a Windows like a WPF app. You could yep. tack on, you know, an ASP.NET uh, mm -hmm. core application, right? And those are your heads essentially. And those are you're saying those are the runtimes. Yeah, those are the runtimes that your app actually runs on. Right? Nothing ever runs on the standard because it's just an abstract thing, right? You always run on a concrete runtime. So is the standard then a contract? That, yes. Okay, so how, how does that work? How does it differentiate from a runtime <coughs> and the standard? Because I think a lot of people, even me early on, I remember talking to Rich, Rich mm -hmm. Landers, a PM at PM .NET. Uh, I was like, I don't understand this core thing. You got the standard thing. You got this 1.x thing. Mm -hmm. you got, then you got .NET framework, and mm -hmm. you got Armano stuff. Um, how, as a developer, can you just, Nip that right now for us. What is it? What yeah, is, so like I think there's there's one analogy that always seems to work for people is that I tell them think of the runtimes as the browsers, right? There's Chrome, there's uh, IE, sadly, <laughs> there's Edge, there's a few other browsers out there, right? And um, then you have the specification, which is you know what HTML constructs are all the browsers expected to render, what CSS are they all expected to honor, right? And then you as an application author or as a as a, as a website author. You basically target, if you will, a version of the standard, like you know HTML5, let's say, yeah. and then you only run on the browsers you know that realistically support HTML5. So IE4 is probably not something you want to run on, and so then from that point of view, it's same with the standard. The standard is effectively, or when I say the standard, the .NET standard is basically a set of APIs that we expect all .NET platforms to implement. Okay, got it. So it's different from the ECMA specification that many people have heard of, which is a really, really, really long. Um, uh, you know, 
documentation that basically covers you know, how the runtime works, how the GC works, how the JIT works, what the metadata format is. So it's more like a, a st traditional you know, written specification. Okay. And the .NET standard is basically just a list of APIs. And so you know, in Visual Studio, when you actually open up um, this thing, we have this thing called .NET standard here as a category, okay. and it only has one entry, and it's basically a class library. So it's still a, a class library. So a class library, I've always thought of it as, like I'm creating a library for this platform. Yes. So I'm creating an iOS class yep. library, and that iOS library is made for iOS. Right. So it only works on iOS. Yes. So what does this mean then? So it's it's conceptually the same thing because I mean if you just like for example look at uh, the Windows Classic Desktop and you select the class library here for .NET Framework, what you're really creating here is a class library where the APIs you can use are constrained to the set of APIs that exist in a particular version of .NET Framework. Yeah. So when I create this thing right now, right now I've selected 4.5 here. So if I would create this thing, I would only get access to APIs that exist in .NET Framework 4.5. And if I you know, drop this to, you know, let's say, 4.6.2 or 4.6.7 uh, you know, or whatever, then I get basically mm -hmm. a different contract, if you will, that has more APIs, namely all the APIs that exist in that version of the platform. Got it. And so the, the standard is the same way, except that you know, ignore the drop down now because it's a UI weirdness. Mm -hmm. Big, but it's logically this, the same thing. So when you create this library, you target a particular version of the standard. And we default to 2.0, you can target 1x as well. And then basically what your class library can access is all the APIs that exist in that version of the standard. Okay. And then by extension, that class library you can consume from any .NET platform that supports that version of the standard or any higher version of that standard. Okay, okay so let's say I come into here and I'm, I'm, I'm an app developer, I'm creating a .NET standard library, and I'm like, I, I potentially I'm going to make an iOS app, maybe a UWP app, maybe a WPF app. Yep. How do I know what this supports? Is, is, I mean, it, does it tell me here? Is there a site that I can go to? Yes, how about we, we just start with this, and then we talk about the versioning later, because okay. versioning is a bit more involved. More usually. involved. But basically what I have here is, um, I no longer have Zoom it installed, apparently. But basically what I have here is a, is, a, is a typical Northwind app, very, very boring. Northwind is our sample database for like you know 30 years or something yeah. like that. Um, so all I do here is I look at the employees of Northwind and like print them out. Okay. And now let's imagine I would like to evolve this app. This is a WinForms app, runs on full framework, right? And now I would like to, to take the, the business logic, which in my case is just the thing that accesses the database, um, and I want to evolve this into something you know, that runs in more places. So what yeah, I would so do maybe is you're going to take this code and run it on iOS or Android or exactly, UWP or, or something. But let's say I make a website or something. Yeah. I, want, I want to evolve it to, to run in different places. So even okay. if I just stay on .NET Framework, let's say I have a website and a, and, a, and, a, and a desktop side, you would usually take this thing and put it into a project, right? Because that's your level of reuse, right? You reference other projects usually to reuse code. Got it. And so in this case, because we want to run on other platforms potentially in the future, we should probably start with the .NET standard. So we just create this guy here. I call this now, let's say, Northwind Data, um, which people have done for years. Right? That's your data access layer where you put your stuff. For, for modern cloud-enabled apps, it's probably more like the thing that talks to the network and actually fetches things from a server. In our case, it's just a database. And my code is really horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I just load a data set hardwired from disk. But basically, like you can imagine I'm actually opening a SQL connection here or I talk to a cloud server, whatever the sure. case might be. And uh, as you can see, everything just compiles fine because I'm targeting that standard 2.0, which is uh, a pretty complete set of APIs, if you will. Like it has all the things in it, that we, even the things we consider legacy, like data sets, because many people use them. Right? And like, what's more annoying than data sets is having to refactor code to get rid of data set. So oh, we added okay, a whole bunch it, yeah. of stuff in there just to make porting easier. Oh, cool. And so everything just works the way you expect. Now if I delete the Northwind uh, DB context out of here, I just add a reference to my new newly created library. Um, you know, no, like, so far this is basically what you've done for years, right? You just put so stuff in So what you did there. is you created a new .NET standard library. Right. You moved over your common code that's like just C sharp .NET code. It's right. like I'm not anything specific about running on Windows, I mean, yep. kind of, but um, not specific about running on iOS or UWP. Yep. This is just C sharp .NET code, data sets, date times, strings, Correct. business logic. Right. And then you added that as a normal reference, just yes. like you always had. And then it just works. Exactly. So like so far, like I mean, this could have been a .NET framework class library. Yeah. And the demo would have looked exactly the same, right? Yep. But the nice thing now is I can create a, um, a web app, and in our case, we go with the .NET Core web app. Okay. So let's add. A, a, do, 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 sorry, I'm in the wrong. They shuffle things around recently, so this is the one I want. 
an ASP.NET Core web application. Exactly. So this will no longer run on .NET Framework. This will run on uh, .NET Core. So okay. it's called this Northwind Web. So you're thinking right now we have two of those uh, columns, essentially. You have your, your .NET Framework, which is running your WinForms app. And now you're going to have .NET Core, which is another runtime, yep. which, ha which implements the .NET standard. Yes. Um, and those are your two heads, those two columns. And then the, the, the common row is going to be that data. Correct. So if cool. I now create this guy, um, same thing here. It looks slightly different. Um, and what I want now is I want to add a reference to my uh, data library again. Got it. And then if I go into my, is it startup? I, uh, yep, it's this one here. I basically want to say message that would be Northwind, Northwind DB get data, right? And then I just output the same thing here. Ah, to, di to disk, there you go, to yeah. uh, the console, perfect. So like super amazing um, demo, right? Because I'm clearly a web developer. <laughs> <laughs> Edit, well, let's actually launch the website. And as you can see, it's the same outcome that we saw in the WinForms app. But, you know, this is now running a .NET Core app, right? So presumably yeah. you could, you know, move this to the cloud, you could run this on Linux, you could run this on uh, OS X. Now, when I say you can, obviously, you know, code like this here will not work, right? So even yeah. though we constrain you to the API surface of what's in the standard, you can, of course, still write code that is not platform, you know, that is not cross-platform, right? If you assume paths to be Windows compliant or, you know, in this case, it's even hardwired, it's even worse than that, right? Yeah. But, but, like, of course, you have to write your code in such a way that, you know, things can be cross-platform. So you could use something here like system I.O., right? And you could get, you yes. could say, you would give me my... Give me my you know, personal folder, do a file picker, and then return. Yes. Basically, you would pass in. Ideally, here, what you do is instead of getting get data, which returns a string, you'd pass it a file path, right? Yeah, either that or, like that or usually, like for a real database, it would actually talk to the database, database. or the network, right? Yeah. In which case, that the, or the cloud, right, realistically. But, but this is kind of cool because this literally is just that C sharp .NET logic that was stuck in that right. app. Now it's being shared now between two apps, but potentially any app and right. any. Uh, framework that supports .NET standard, which yeah, is yeah. So I I could now you know create a Xamarin app, I could create a UWP app, and I could just add a reference to the exact same library, right? So this way you can reuse, you know, potentially your 15 year old business logic uh, that you've written in the .NET uh, framework v1 days, right? Yeah. And, and the other thing I would like to show here is that this is a .NET standard library. So if we just copied and pasted some code in, but usually, so there's two sides to to your own project. Usually your own code and then your dependencies, right? Yeah. And then historically, the way portable class libraries and .NET Standard have worked is that they constrain you not just in the API service, they also constrain what you can reference. Because it's really weird if you reference, a, you know, when you create a portable class library, but you reference, let's say, an iOS library, right? That ma ma makes no sense anymore, yeah, right? Yeah, totally. So, but we said, you know what? The reality today is that when you look at NuGet.org, the vast majority of libraries on NuGet.org are general purpose libraries. They're yeah. not tied to a particular application model like WinForms or, or ASP.NET. However, they, uh, they're compiled against .NET Framework because that's the only game in town for like, you know, yeah. you know 15 years. There, it was a de facto forever and, and still it's, yes. it's kind of what some library creators think of. I'm just going to go in and create a new library, right? Exactly. So like now it. let me just add a, a library, a reference to a library that I've written myself like, you know, a long time ago actually. It's called nQuery, and it's basically uh, a helper, if you will, that makes uh, data sets a little bit more interesting. So as you can see here, the data, I published this in 2012, yeah, but the so library is from so, so a lot of stuff didn't even exist back then. No, yeah. there was no portable yeah. libraries, I think. Yeah. I think even that came uh, I, Yeah, I think after. there was no PCLs at that time. There was no, there right. was no .NET Core, no .NET Standard. Yeah. So what's interesting now is you saw that the installation just succeeded. Interesting. And, and, uh, but you now get a warning. OK. And so why is that? Well, because I mean, if you read the warning here, basically what it says is you are installing a package that is designed for .NET Framework. Yep. Um, but what you want to do is you want to say, you know, I'm targeting the standard, but it's a .NET Framework library. So we will basically let it bind and let's see what happens. But if things go south, like things blow up, just so you know, this was a .NET Framework binary. So in theory, this library could activate WinForms controls or talk with ASP.NET, right? And those things will not work in .NET Center because the APIs are not there, right? Got it. Does it fail silently or does it explode? No, it usually <laughs> fails spectacularly with like, you know, you know, a method not found exception. That's the best something. way to do it, right? So like, yeah, it will, it will, you will notice, right? Yeah. <laughs> like it's not something that will silently fail. 
But the thing is, we give you the warning here so you can root cause where this is coming from. So there's the bug in the library. It's okay. the library wasn't designed for the standard, right? Got it. And now in my case, I have some sample code here that I prepared earlier, so I can just delete my hardwired data set logic here and replace it with what I have in my library, which kind of gives you a SQL uh, engine for data sets. So you can oh, okay. just uh, run SQL select queries. Nice. And it does everything in memory. And, um, you know, but as you can imagine, this query engine, all it does is, you know, it parses some, s you know, select statements. So it doesn't really, you know, do anything crazy. So you would expect that to work um, just fine. So let's actually. Yeah, because a lot of older libraries that even I created, w if they were just .NET libraries. Yes. We're just calling .NET code, nothing, nothing crazy spectacular. Correct. So now we're actually seeing. So code. it still works fine. So it also, and this works on .NET Framework, which is unsurprising because that's where it was designed to run on. So that's kind of cool though, because that means that if you're creating a Xamarin app, and there was all these libraries that you could never consume because they're restricted, now you could just import those into a .NET standard library. Right. With, and the library creator doesn't have to go update it or. You know, figure that all out. You know, because who knows like where that code even lives? Sometimes, right. yeah. Right. That's kind of cool. And so, like the idea here really is like you can evolve your own code base, and you can also unblock yourself when you have dependencies that are still compiled for .NET Framework. Yeah, that right? makes sense. And like I mean, on Mono, it's always been the case that you can run .NET Framework binaries on Mono, mm -hmm. and I think that's also true for Xamarin. Like, of course, when they use APIs that Xamarin doesn't have, you I think you fail in the same way. Like yeah. if it uses configuration, it will not work either. But the reality is that most things just work. And like okay. our goal here was to make more things work as opposed to being super conservative and you know go out of our way to make things not work that could have worked otherwise. Yeah, so that it's, makes a, sense. it's a bit more yeah. you know, opportunistic, if you will. It's like we're, we're a smart group of amazing developers here at Microsoft. We can probably figure out what this thing is using and tell you, yes. you know, in, in a way. So that's pretty cool though. So so now We've kind of gone over, as an app developer, I, I may have this existing code that may be in an existing share project PCL or just stuck right. into a specific platform. I can kind of rip that out kind of yes. architecturally and say, no, this doesn't really care about the platform. I want to start trying to share this with other applications and, yes. and just go in and new. Now, inside that, I, I, this is the new SDK stuff. So we see NuGet and SDK under dependencies. Yep. So um, that's where all my NuGets live. And then how do I select what version of .NET standard do I want? Yeah, so do, what do I care as a developer? So it's the same as it always been. If you open up Northwind, where this is .NET Framework, and yep. if you open .NET standard, uh, which is this one it's here. It looks very familiar. It looks exactly the same. Right? If you just uh, put Boom. them side by side, you see mm -hmm. here on the .NET Framework side, we just say .NET Framework version. And on the .NET standard side, we just give you the .NET standard versions. Right? Okay. So like, it's exactly the same experience. And uh, this is where you would say, oh, I want to you know, run on 1.0, and then you know, things would stop compiling because I'm using data sets, which is new in 2.0. Um, but that's generally our recommendation, is target the lowest version you get away with. Mm -hmm. I usually tell people, if you don't know which version you want, start with 2.0, because it's realistically the one that has uh, you know, most of the concepts already baked in. And if you really want to run you know, on more platforms, you can drop the version later and see how many compiler errors you get and whether you care to fix them and like, work them around. So kind of as an app developer. Now, can we talk about the different versions here? Because as yes. an app developer, Absolutely. right, it kind of would make sense to start at a 2.0 because I'm assuming 2.0 is better than 1.0. Uh, yes. So one, one thing one that has is- has to assume. Uh, well, better is relative. So that's the thing that is, uh, depends on what you care about. <laughs> Got it. So we have this version table here. And, okay. uh, I wish I would get money every single time somebody doesn't understand the table. Um, <laughs> so I did an interactive version of the table. Ooh, which interactive I table. Which I think helps a little bit. Okay. Uh, so what you have here is uh, basically, so this is the version we are targeting. So Got this it. is .NET Standard 1.0. What this table now tells you is all the places you can run and what's the minimum version of those platforms that you have to have in order to consume a .NET Standard 1.0 okay. library. So what it, what it tells you is if you target .NET Standard 1.0, you run in all places, unsurprisingly. But what it also tells you is that the minimum version you need to run to from .NET Framework is 4.5. Got it. What it also tells you is that you know, for example, you know, UWP is version 10, right? This was the first version of UWP, and now as we are moving this guy up, we're basically seeing that more and more mm. things like stop working because mm. you get more API surface, right? So like as the version number of the standard increases, you see at the very top here the blue bar. Yeah. It's an indication of like, you know, how many APIs do you have. There seems to be a big jump right there. Yeah, between 1.6 and 2.0, there's a huge <laughs> spike because we more than doubled the API surface. Got it. So like, it's better from the point of view you have more APIs, but it's worse from the standpoint you run only on fewer platforms and 
Um, basically, that means you have to make a decision, you know, how much you care about reach versus uh, email functionality, right? Got it. So that's the trade-off that you have to keep in mind. That's why I said it's, it's relative whether it's better or not. So for example, if you still care about Windows Phone Silverlight, which I hope most people don't because it's replaced with UWP, you no longer run on, on, on Windows Phone Silverlight, right? But same goes here. Let's say your IT department says you can only run on .NET Framework 4.6. Got it. Well, then, you know, two would may not work for you. You have to be on 1.3 at that point. Got right? it. Okay. This makes sense. So even though .NET Framework, different flavors or different versions of the .NET Framework essentially implement different .NET standard APIs. So that way, yes. like, if you're like, as an app developer, I'm like, hey, I only, I'm creating a brand new app, and I'm like, I want to create the latest and greatest iOS, Android, and UWP app, right? Right. And maybe I also want to go to .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, or something like that, right? So to me, I'm like, I want the latest and greatest, and I just want all the APIs. I would go 2.0 because I got everything there. Right. But if I'm like, oh man, I'm at an enterprise where I have to worry about supporting five-year-old hardware, then I'm going to be a little bit more selective and come into this little selector, it looks like, to say, right. what do I need for that specific <laughs> library, right? Because you could have a bunch of different libraries based on what you're sharing in your app. What is interesting, though, that people, people see, seem to think that the version information is super critical. I think in practice it doesn't matter too much mm. because at the end if you target two, if you look at it, all the recent platforms we care about because Windows, Windows Phone Silver, Windows Phone Silver were all replaced by UWP, right? Yeah. So like all the platforms that we care about, you know, Android, iOS, and I haven't even listed them all. There's also Unity and other places here, but all of them support 2.0. Now the question is just which version do you need to have? And again, like for most platforms, the version numbers don't doesn't matter so much because you can pretty much carry it with your app, yeah. or you can easily update it. So the, realistically, the only one where it's a bit more tricky is .NET Framework because it's a machine-wide install that the enterprise dictates. Got it. But so like realistically, that means th the thing that probably has the biggest impact on your .NET standard version is .NET Framework if you care about it. If you don't care about it at all because you're only building mobile apps, then just always target latest because you just need the latest version of Xamarin, and that should. That get you everywhere, right? So yeah. like that, that that does not make any sort of, um, you know, it doesn't add any constraints to you on what version of the standard you can use. Yeah, so probably for most people watching who are just creating iOS, Android, and Windows 10 applications, um, you know, they may have a back end as well, obviously. Right. But it seems like the, the go to is essentially just 2.0. I'm going to share yep. the most amount of code. And in fact, our templates now have a .NET standard which does 2.0. So it's kind of like, boom, yep. it's there, right? So are there, are there some instances then? Where I would use .NET standard, or I would use shared projects. I mean, this is probably hotly debated. Like, I'm an, as an app developer, yes. right? I have my own opinions, but I want to hear emails. Yeah. So, like, I think like if you if you compare the two. So, one thing I would uh, I have a project here where I can demo that. Um, I don't have UWP. I don't have a Xamarin hat here, but it would equally apply there. So, what I have here is well, let me switch back to the, to the starting point. The magic of Git branches. Uh, <laughs> so, what I have here is I have two apps, um, and let me actually launch them. So I have a regular WinForms app again, and I have a WP app, and they both do the same thing, if it ever starts up. All right, so now let's go with this guy. So this is the WinForms app, and I can also run a WP app. Got it. And so they both do the same thing. They basically Look tell that you beautiful application. Yes, you can tell I'm a designer, right? Yes, like it's, it's looks very good. Like amazing. Um, Basically, it shows you the GPS coordinates you're at. Got and like, they both agree because they're on the same physical device, so unsurprising. Um, the tricky thing now is, let's say I actually write um, you know, applications that frequently need to access the, the GPS. Um, mm -hmm. So what you now want to do is you want to say, OK, I want to encapsulate that logic, how I get access to the GPS coordinates in a library, right? Yeah, because each of the apps are doing the same things, but those calls to the GPS are platform specific, right? They're not .NET Correct. calls. They're, they're, they're like Windows and UWP calls, basically, yes. right? Yes, and they're not necessarily straightforward. So this is, mm -hmm. for example, on .NET Framework, this is how you would get access to the GPS thing. You would, you would instantiate the geo coordinate watcher. You would mm -hmm. have to do this little dance here because the first time you call, they may not be initialized. Got it. Do some things, and because it's all synchronous, you probably want to do this on a worker thread so you don't block the UI. So I wrap this thing in this thing that is an async API that gives you basically back a tuple, latitude, longitude, and it's an async API, which you can clearly tell I follow my own guidelines, so I didn't suffix it with async. <laughs> uh, bad, bad boy I'm, that I am. Anyway, like the, the thing is you can just await this thing and you get back the, the, the GPS thing. 
on the on the UWP side, it's it's different. So we don't use system dot something. We use Windows dot devices, which is the WinRT API, and the API already is asynchronous here. So I just await this thing. Uh, but you know, you can see the API is slightly different. So the latitude is somewhere else, only to somewhere else. But I can basically replicate this into the same you know shape, if you will. Yeah. And for me as an app developer, the first thing I would think that I would have to do, I have two options. This is what I'm thinking. Because I've done, like, I've plugins for this stuff, right? So I would create an interface. Yes. And I would say, I get coordinates, it returns a tuple tuple. Yep. And then I go implement it, and then I use some dependency injection right. or service locator to essentially give me my iGeo locator back. That's like my mind. My second thought here is that I would create a shared project, which right. is, is not a library, right? right? It's just code files. Right. And I would conditionally compile it. So I would yes. say, you know, pound. UWP run this logic, so yep. like inside of it, it, the same code would be in one method. Yes. So I could call it. It's almost as if that file is just copied into each of them. Yes. So does .NET standard libraries do something different then? Yeah. That? So like we basically do the thing in the middle. As you just said, there's two extremes. Right? One extreme is portable, where you're completely screwed. You basically have to basically have multiple different libraries that you create, yeah. and you have an interface in between, and then whoever calls the API has to wire up the correct in, you know instance of that, yep. which is not bad. It just means you have to use a dependency injection framework, and that's a little bit more heavy way to set up. Shared frameworks, uh, sorry, shared projects on the other side are super lightweight because you just have one API that, that you call, and then you just have a different uh, implementation. Yeah. But as you said, shared projects are really great for apps because you basically share source code. You don't share binaries. Yeah, exactly. And what we have here is basically the thing in the middle, basically the best of both worlds. So, like, let me just fast forward here because I'm, I'm magic. Wah, 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 wah. Uh, so now I have a single library. Magic. And the single library looks as you just described. It basically mm -hmm. has an if def in it that says if .NET Framework, you do this. If UWP, do this. Else, I don't know what to do, right? But yeah. we can easily imagine that we have else iOS, else Android, else you know fidgety fudge, whatever the next platform ends up being, yeah. right? And then you, do, you you just write your code. What's nice now is I actually have this project configured slightly differently. So what I have done here is I have set this project here. Is actually compiling multiple times, mm. so it's compiling for .NET standard, it's compiling for .NET framework, and it's compiling for UWP. Now these identifiers look very familiar to me because as a library creator, I'm used to essentially outputting specific like tags, like say yes. this is my iOS library, this is my Android library. When I install the NuGet, if I'm installing it into iOS, I get the iOS version. Correct. So that these identifiers look very familiar to me. And so what ends up happening now is this library is literally compiled. Like three times, right? Mm -hmm. And if you add Xamarin iOS and Xamarin uh, Android, then it would even compile more times. Okay. And you can do the same thing also with multiple projects. It's just with these new SDK style projects, you have this really concise way to do this thing. But lo lo logically, you can think of you have basically three projects. Yeah. They all reference the same shared code base. But what's nice is if I can just go here, I can say, I would like to get a NuGet package out of this. So I can just go here under package and say, create a NuGet package. Ah, got it. Okay. And so what now ends up happening is we compile this thing three times, and then we package up all three binaries in one NuGet package. Mm. So the consumer of this thing basically sees essentially the API surface as being net standard. Got so it. the API surface has to be net standard compliant. But the implementation doesn't have to be, right? The implementation, this is a .NET Framework implementation, this is a UWP implementation. So you can do whatever you want in your, in your implementation. What this allows you to do is that basically somebody can say, you know, I'm the expert in GPS devices across all operating systems, and I can give one API for everybody. Mm. So you can basically create libraries that essentially wrap operating system specific constructs. That's very nice. And so now that means is everybody who consumes this thing, they don't have to cross compile, they don't have to you know, have multiple projects, they can just add a reference to a single NuGet package. And from their point of view, there's no difference between a regular single binary NuGet package and a NuGet package that has 500 binaries, right? Got it, yeah. So as a library creator, I could start, I could start essentially building my package and support it as they go, right? I might even have some base. GPS helper methods that are right. in the .NET standard that support everything, like yes. even inside your .NET uh, standard library, which is really cool. Okay, this, and what is this feature called? It has a specific name, or so the thing, the way we call it in Visual Studio is multi-targeting because you mm. create essentially multiple Target. outputs, right? And if you look at the output folder here, if we if we if we build it, um, you know, bin debug is familiar, but then we also okay. have subdirectories per the thing you're compiling for. Got it. And then we drop the NuGet package here because it's the aggregate of all of them, right? Very cool. So it's super, super nice. The other thing that is interesting here is, as you said, a whole platform not supported, right? 
So the question is now, well, how is that useful? And yeah. the, the answer is, well, imagine you're writing a Twitter client, right? In the, in, the, in the Twitter client case, if you can get the GPS coordinates, it just means you can't tag your tweets. Right? Nothing bad happens. Yeah. Like it just means there's a feature that you don't have in your app. Got it. So that means I can I can also write a property now. I could say, you know, public um, static bool is supported, right? Yeah. And clearly, I can do the same thing that I do here with like my if def, right? I could just say, take all of this guy here, um, put this here, and then I just say, you know, if yeah, if this or this four six one or Windows. Then 10. we just say return true. true. Otherwise, the answer is return false. Now, what that means also for consuming code is consuming code can basically say, you know, okay, I can either just catch the exception or I can ask upfront whether the GPS functionality is there. So this way, you can basically also wrap optional features in the mm -hmm. standard libraries, and you can say, yep, you may or may not have a GPS device, and you have one API that, that uh, deals with that, which also makes the package now essentially work on literally any implementation of the standard, because cool. your contract is just, you know, it, it may or may not be there, right? Yeah, that makes sense. This is exactly this. So like a lot of Xamarin developers are probably used to plugins for Xamarin and Windows, yep. which some of them go through this route. Some do the old bait and switch type yep. hack, but it's very similar. Like they all have an is supported, at least mine do. At least they have like an is supported, and then if not, I return the platform right. specific versions of it. But this kind of, as an app, library creator, this kind of simplifies my life because maybe I start, that's how I'm thinking, right? Maybe I start with the .NET standard library, then, oh man, I want to get one access to that one little thing, yes. right? And then I think, oh, I have to switch over to create another shared library or do something else, but yep. I could just come in and do this. Yes. Yeah. And so that's, that's, that's pretty powerful. And like the, but, the, but, the, but the really key thing is you as a library author have to do multiple things now, but you consumers, for them, it's completely transparent. They just install it and done. Yep. Yep. Very cool. I think this really covers not only from the app developer side of thing, kind of clarifies everything for me at least when it comes to .NET standard, but also from the library creators. And I've heard and seen this feature a bunch, but actually this is really concrete, just great example of yep. when that type of thing you would want to use it. Because I know a lot of our developers are like, man, I just wish I had access to that, you know, current device on iOS, and can I just, you know, see if it's a iPhone X, right? Yes. Um, for instance, which would be really cool just to kind of do it right inside that .NET standard library. Very cool. And this is available not only in is it available in all versions of Visual Studio, or so? That's a great question. I believe this is a uh, this is a regular MS build feature, so it's okay. in all editions of Visual Studio, but it's only in 2017. And it's yeah. not available in 2015. And Visual Studio for Mac? Uh, great question. I don't know. Yeah, it is. Okay. Don't worry. That was po <laughs> that was quizzing quizzing emo. Well, awesome. I think anything else you wanted to talk about at all? Or you think I think um, you crushed it. So the only it. thing that, that is worth mentioning is that, you know, as we we're talking about porting code, mm -hmm. usually what people do is when they port code is they, they try to do everything in one step and it usually doesn't end very well, depending yeah. on how big your code base is. So we, we have this other blog post that I want to pitch here with the Windows Compat Pack, um, which doesn't really help you to build Xamarin apps. But usually what ends up happening is when you have an existing desktop app and you want to effectively create multiple experiences, right? A web experience and a mobile experience. So you yeah. start taking your, your application apart and like creating libraries. Some of the libraries maybe don't have standard libraries, some of them maybe don't have framework only binaries, sure. right? Um, and then what you really want to do is you want to say, well, there may be some things I want to share between my .NET Core web app and my Windows desktop app. But for now, I only want the Core app on Windows because I want to do this in stages, right? Sure. First I move to Core, then I move to the cloud maybe, and then I move to Linux, right? And so yeah. the Windows Compat Pack basically gives you a click stop along the way, if you will, mm -hmm. where you get a ton more APIs on .NET Core. Okay. And a good chunk of them are Windows specific. So like registry is in there, or you know, WMI is in there, like you know, event lock is there. So all the stuff you shouldn't be using when you're on Linux. But if you have a very large existing code base, you want to say, you know, first I want to move to core. So I don't want to close my, you know, you know, developer, you know, uh, shop for like six months yeah, to do well, the I whole porting. Do it, yeah. I want to do something in like two months, get the whole thing on .NET Core, Got and then it. I'm still Windows only. And the next thing is .NET Core in the cloud, and the next thing is then I don't know .NET Core on Linux. Right? And Got so it. this way you have you have options. And the, the the way you would use the Compat Pack is similar to this, um, where you would basically say, well, if I'm running on Windows, I can call the API. If I'm not running on Windows, I don't call the API. So this way you can start right, making your code more cross plat friendly. Oh, okay. Nice. But like the key is you, you port in stages. You don't do this, you know, big yeah. switch, and then you can't have anything for like six months. Until yeah, that makes sense. Fixed. So it's kind of an app developer. If I have my ASP.NET backend, I can easily start bringing it over to 
a .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, anything like that. And I'm like, right. I'm just going to run it on Windows anyway, so it's okay for now. Yes. But maybe in the future, this gives me the ability to go to more platforms. Right. Very cool. All right, awesome, email. I love it. I love awesome. it. We'll put all those links in the show notes below. Perfect. Well, Emo, thank you so much for coming on the Xamarin Show, talking about all this .NET goodness. Always happy to. Yeah. So thanks for all of you. Uh, this has been yet another episode of the Xamarin Show. I'm your host, James Montemagno. And don't forget to subscribe up over there, up over there. If you're on YouTube, it's down there. Hit that ding button. Subscribe everywhere so you get the latest and greatest in your inbox. And until next time, thanks for watching.